So my husband, Kevin, and I have been working on a jigsaw puzzle, thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. It's really hard. <laughs> but I've been thinking about jigsaw puzzles a lot because we started January 6th. We're almost, maybe a little more than halfway done with it. But think about jigsaw puzzles is most people will start from the outside edge, right? You, you work on the edge first, and you have a picture of what it's supposed to look like. And then you start working on corners, different parts of the picture, different parts of it. And piece by piece, you build this picture. And I was thinking about how that compares to life. How about how many people, most people probably, start with the outside and work in. They let the outside decide how the rest of it's going to go. They have a picture for their life of how they think it should look. And then piece by piece, build their life working from the outside edges. But life doesn't always work that way. It, it, it does work that way, but it doesn't, it's not as rich. It's not as full. What if we worked on a puzzle and worked on our life from the inside out? And we didn't even pay attention to those edges. And we just worked on bringing whatever is in us outside. Then we're following our guidance. Then we're letting God direct our lives. There's a story of an old Scottish woman who lived in the country, and she went around from door to door selling, selling buttons and thread and needles and things like that. And the story goes that she would throw a stick in the air. When she came to a fork in the road, she'd throw a stick in the air, and whichever way the stick pointed, that's the way she would move that direction. Until one day someone spotted her throwing that stick in the air many times. And they asked her, why are you throwing that stick in the air so many times? And she said, because it keeps pointing to the left, and I want to go right. Well... How many of us do that in life, right? We decide how we want to go instead of letting our guidance dictate, letting our guidance give us direction. And what happens if we're always turning right? We're just going around in circles. We're not really making any forward movement. We need to let spirit direct us, God to guide us. A couple weeks ago, we did our white stone ceremony where we discerned a new name, something that is longing to come forth, something that is longing to express in a better version of ourselves. And we wrote that name on a white stone that was setting an intention for the year. This is how we want to show up this year. This is what attribute or quality that we want to develop in ourselves, that we want to embody. Now, that's great, and it's a really important process, but we have to make sure we're moving in that direction. And what can help us move in that direction is creating a theme for the year. That, yeah, we want to inspire personal transformation, which is our mission here at Columbine, but how are we going to do that this year? What direction is spirit calling up for us to go? Having a theme gives us focus. It charts the course for us. It, it helps us have more fun and, and be more creative. But it keeps us on track. And so with Columbine, we set a theme every year. And you know what happens when we follow that theme, when we set that direction and we move in that, in that, on that course, is that it helps build that reward, that motivation and reward part of our brain, that dopamine hormone that, that gets produced as we live our lives, as we set out to, as we check those boxes off. And it helps us feel good. It's that feel-good hormone. Who wouldn't want to have more of that, right? Who wouldn't want to feel good? This past year, we could all certainly use a lot more feel-good hormone. It's been a challenging year. We've drawn lines in the sand. We've decided what side we're on. 
And so we felt called as a, as a church staff to use the theme, seeing through a spiritual lens, to expand our way of viewing things. Many of us became more aware of places that needed to be healed, of things that maybe were a little broken. And it can feel like in this new month of the year, like it's just a lot of the same old, same old. Like it's a used year. Like we're not, we haven't really moved beyond this yet, but we're making progress. And so we want to set this year up for hope, and set this year up for a new way of being. We became aware of what needs to be healed, and now we get to work on healing it. You can feel the change in the air. You can feel that there's, there's stuff going on. People are getting vaccinated in our community. We can choose to heal this year. We can choose to move forward. Elizabeth Lesser says in Broken Open, the promise of being broken and the possibility of being opened are written into the contract of human life. Certainly, this tumultuous journey on the waves can be tiresome. When the sea is rough and when we are suffering, we may want to give up hope and give in to despair, but brave pilgrims have gone before us. They tell us to venture forth with faith and vision. It takes courage to live a life of faith. It takes courage to move forward when we would rather just stay locked inside ourselves. I keep thinking as I've been working with this book and working with our theme of a turtle and how turtles have this hard outer shell and when they're afraid, they just stay in their shell. But to move forward, they have to venture out of that shell. The same with chicks in an egg. They start pecking at that outer shell. Butterflies in a chrysalis start moving and breaking that outer covering in order for new life to emerge. I was running the other day, and where I run, there are ponds, and there's always a lot of geese. And I was watching the geese because the ponds are about half frozen. And they're so cute the way they very gently walk on the ice to get to the water. I don't know why they're on the ice in the first place, but they very gently, and I was thinking of how, how we do that how we walk really gently. We don't want to break through that ice. We don't want to ruffle any feathers or upset the apple cart. We're very gentle about how we don't want to actually live fully. We have this outer shell. But to get to the living water, you, you have to move. You have to break through the shell. And there's a freedom in it. There's a freedom when we can allow ourselves to break through that ice, to melt our hearts, to come out of that hard shell. There's a freedom there. There's a transparency there. There's a healing there. It takes courage. It takes faith. But we want to not be like the puzzle living from the outside in. We want to live from the inside out. Listening to that guidance and that direction of spirit. We want to break open instead of break down. Breaking open to all of life and all its aspects of life and all of our wholeness and everything that it entails means seeing with God eyes, hearing with God ears, seeing ourselves that way and seeing everyone else that way, that everyone has their own outer shell that they're break, trying to break through or not. It's always our choice on whether we break through that shell or not, break through that ice or not. We've seen from this past year where we need to heal 
where we need love instead of hate, where we need uni unity instead of division, where we need to break open instead of breaking down, where we can live life more fully and open to all aspects of ourselves. Can you guess what our theme is? I'm going to let you, the board and staff is not allowed to play this. Oh, you've, oh no, don't put that slide up yet. <laughs> I, want to, I want to give people a chance to guess and put it in the chat box. I don't know if there'll be a prize, but <laughs> I hadn't thought that far ahead. But it can be more painful to stay closed than it can be to open to our whole selves. It's not easy. This past year has shown us how unfair life can feel, how unjust, how sad. We've seen some broken bits, but we can choose to heal them. President Biden, in his inaugural address, said this one line that I just love, we can open our souls instead of hardening our hearts. You getting closer to the theme? <laughs> I always like to find a little scripture that, that helps with this, with the ideas. And the one I could come closest to, the one that seemed to be closest to this, was when we rent the veil. Of course, this happens in the Gospels. It's said in the Gospels when, right after Jesus is crucified. Now, we don't have to have a crucifixion experience to rent the veil, but often we do. Often we rent the veil when something difficult, we've been through something difficult. Renting the veil is, goes back to biblical times when in the temple, in the Jer Jewish temple, there was a veil, there was a cloth from floor, ceiling to floor that separated one part of the temple where the general public went to the Holy of Holies to that shrine, to that sacred shrine, and only one priest was allowed to go behind the veil one time a year. But to rent the veil, to tear the veil, means to break through and come face to face with that God self within us. Tearing down that last barrier between us and our divine selves, between our personality selves and our divine essence. This is what breaks us open. Renting that veil is a breaking open. You got it now, what our theme is? <laughs> I'm kind of giving it away. We have access to our higher selves when we do this. And so the staff and, and I were talking, and we, we spend months on talking about it, thinking about it, though, what's our theme going to be? And we had one, and of course, at the last minute, it got changed because <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't quite capture the direction that we felt we needed to go in this year. That all of us have remained really, many of us, I should say, have remained tightly closed. We've been quarantining. We've been staying home. But isn't it time it can become more painful to stay that way than to blossom fully. And so here, without further ado, is our theme for the year. Break wide open. And this was inspired by the book Broken Open by Elizabeth Lesser, which we will start a new series on next week. And I can't read that from here, but <laughs> you can read it from home. This is a quote that Elizabeth Lesser found when she was, um, she was visiting a monastery or something. I not quite, can't quite remember. And she saw this quote. And the time came when the risk... <laughs> okay, you can read it at home. <laughs> I can't read it, it's too small. And I didn't put it down here in my notes. So we have a choice. 
We have a choice. We can break wide open. We can choose to rent the veil. We can break the shell and melt the ice that's around our hearts. We're given countless opportunities in life. There are always more invitations to do this. We can look at the outer world and allow it to harden our hearts. Or we can choose to see with a wider lens and see grace. Elizabeth Lesser asked these questions in Broken Open. How can we use these difficult times as opportunities to grow, to change, to take responsibility, each and every one of us, so that we stop repeating the mistakes of the past? Can we find the light shining through the broken places in the world? Can we become the light, reclaim our dignity, and forge a new path? I know we can do this, and it begins within each one of us. Think about your life and where you might need to break the ice. Where are you walking like the geese gingerly, not wanting to break that ice? Where are you working your life from the outside in, like that jigsaw puzzle, instead of the inside out? Choose instead to break your heart wide open, break your soul wide open, and live life more fully. We're changing things up today, and I want to close with part of Amanda Gorman's poem from the inaugural address, this beautiful poem that she wrote. She says, when day comes, we step out of the shade aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it. Be brave enough to be that light. And now I want to turn it over to Janice and company, who Janice wrote a beautiful new theme song for the year that can open our hearts to this theme. And that when she's done, then Scott will be sharing his thoughts on our theme. I don't want to be broken down And I don't want to be let low to the ground And I don't want to be shot Don't wanna be left helpless and for love. I wanna break wide, wide open. I wanna break wide. break 
so much. Beautiful. And in that song, in the words that Janice wrote, we're reminded, right, that, uh, how did she put it, open to our divinity so that our magnificence would no longer be hidden, open to the light so it can shine open to new beginnings, to new life. That's the invitation. And in fact, when you study the soul, you find out that that's the orientation of each of our souls, that our souls want to be free. Our souls want to experience the potential of life, however that comes to us. And most of the time it requires then breaking wide open, breaking out of old patterns, breaking loose of beliefs that have held us in their grasp for so long. The interesting thing is that life, I was talking to a friend this week, she said, oh, I think my life's probably given me hundreds of thousands of opportunities to break wide open. And yet, so often, we don't accept that invitation. And why is that? We could look at it from many different ways today. But what came to me is how interesting it might be to look at it from the perspective of neuroscience and how our brain works. I think we might learn something. Let's see what happens. A friend of mine likes to use her arm and her hand to illustrate our brain. And if we do that, then the arm becomes the spinal cord, right? And the palm of our hand becomes the, um, 
well, what do we call it? <laughs> I'm always, this is the part of the brain that for some reason I have some kind of block about. It becomes the brain stem. And the brain stem, if you know anything about the brain, and by the way, I am no expert on the brain, <laughs> but uh, the brain stem handles sort of the unconscious things that happens, our heartbeat, our breath rate, the contraction of our capillaries so that blood is, the flow of blood is um, controlled and moved through the body. It's, uh, we often also can call it the more reptilian part of the brain. It, it just does what it does. If we put our thumb then across our palm, that becomes the limbic area of the brain. Now this is a very interesting area. The limbic brain is intended to keep us safe. It is the part of us that responds to life or reacts to life. It's more rudimentary and yet for many of us, it has a huge impact on our lives. And then if we take our fingers and wrap them around that thumb, this then becomes the cortex. And about the area where your fingernails are is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is what makes us uniquely human. It distinguishes us from being an animal, from just being someone that reacts or something that reacts to life. What's interesting is that the limbic brain, that part that's tucked in between, reacts so quickly to the events of our lives, especially when something causes it to be triggered. And it reacts in a way that it feels that it knows. It knows without doubt what's happening and then it leaps into some kind of action, usually with a great deal of energy and a great deal of emotion, or at least it can be that way. The frontal cortex, in contrast, doesn't respond so quickly. It takes a second or more for it to respond, but it is the part of us that is able to reflect, the part of us that can see the bigger picture, the part of us that can question, and the part of us that can choose. It's a really important part. It's a part of us that has empathy and compassion. It is the part of us that we often call the adult, and it is the part of us that can really open to our nature as a spiritual being. But what happens is when life comes along and triggers us because that limbic brain reacts so quickly, it can often cause us to blow our lid. Now, of course, this is symbolic, right? We don't actually blow the top off of our head. But what happens when we blow our lid is we lose connection with the frontal cortex. We lose connection with that ability to see the bigger picture, to choose, to question, to really learn and grow. When I was in public accounting, which was a long time ago, I think I left public accounting when I was 26, but I, if you know how public accounting works, we go out to a client's location. And I worked for a large firm, so we had predominantly very large clients where you could be there for weeks, sometimes months. And you would work with a team. And so when I was in public accounting, I was working on a large client. And a member of my team, a woman, came in one day. And she was pretty diswrought. She had found out the night before that her husband was having an affair. And she was very much in that victim state. She, her limbic brain was active and had blown the lid off, let's put it that way, you know. And we, I think we all can kind of relate to this. She was talking about how could he do this to me? I've been a good wife. I've been faithful. I'm, I uh, work and I'm also the mother of his child and I take care of that little two. I can't remember if their child was two or three, but it was very young. She was very caught up in that sort of victim mentality and the story was all about him and what he had done to her, right? 
How much learning goes on from that place? Not much. We don't really grow. We hold the other accountable. And we don't get to see what the possibility is here. Oh, she was broken. But I don't know that we would say that she was broken wide open. That went on for a week. And, and I wouldn't say, you know, she was mature enough that she didn't spend the whole day just bemoaning what was going on. But something very interesting happened the following Monday. When she came in, she and I were working in an office together, in a room together, I should say. And I said to her, how you doing? And she said, you know, something very interesting happened over the weekend. I was watching a TV program, and there was a couple portrayed in the program where the wife was dancing around the house and singing. And I realized I used to do that. When I was first married, I would sing and dance, sometimes in my underwear all over the house. I was free and full of joy. And she goes, I haven't done that for years. And she went on to tell me that a very unfortunate accident had happened early in her marriage where her husband's leg, just the lower, like I think six to eight inches of his leg and his foot were mangled, and he was unconscious. And the doctors, after several days of this, the doctors who were monitoring him and who had been you know, keeping her appraised the whole time said, we're at a critical point of either risking your husband's life or we need to amputate that lower portion of his leg. And of course, loving her husband and wanting to assure that he lived, she approved the amputation. When he woke up, he was angry. He said, now interesting to know whether this was true, but he said he would rather have died than to have lost the lower part of his leg. And he held her responsible. You know how when we can't forgive, when we can't let go, then whenever something gets triggered in us, then we keep bringing it up. So they'd probably been married at this point five years, not a whole lot. Well, you know, their child was two or three, so I'm going to say they were married five years at this point. And she said that uh, very honestly, in that little room, in our client's uh, location, she said, I'm not sure why I've stayed with them. I don't think I've even questioned why I've stayed with them. Maybe it was out of some sense of guilt for what I've done, or she said I was you know, raised traditionally where you stay with your husband. But I didn't realize that I had lost my joy. And she went so far as to say, I wonder if this affair hasn't awakened me. What happened with her? From the brain sciences standpoint, her cortex came back online. Her frontal cortex was open to the guidance, which isn't it interesting how guidance can come through a TV program, right? be open to anything. From there, she was awakened. And probably, see if you can't relate to the fact that, you know when something pretty significant happens in our lives, an affair, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, there's something in us that's paying more attention. Or maybe we're just more susceptible, more open. But in that moment, she could see that the joy was gone in her marriage. And instead, it was absolutely, it was a few months of total wonder to me. Instead of, you know, hiring a high-powered attorney and really taking this guy for all he's got, 
she was able to go to her husband and to say, you know, this is painful. I wish this hadn't happened. But this is demonstrating to me that, or highlighting for me, that I don't find joy in our marriage. And we've worked on this. And I've called you many times on the fact that it's time to forgive me, time to let go of this anger around the fact that I had your lower leg amputated or approved for your lower leg to be amputated. And she divorced him, actually very amicably. Of course, it opened up to all sorts of challenges, right? We're not saying it was a cakewalk. Now she's a CPA. CPAs, we work long hours. Um, but there was a certain joy that came back into her. She became lots of fun to work with, and we laughed about the challenges that she found herself in. And uh, after I, I left the firm sometime after that, um, but I heard from my closer friends in the firm that she got remarried. I have no idea how that marriage went, but you can see the potential, not only for love and joy, but the potential to live a much freer, more open life, a life with a partner that was supportive instead of tearing her down, to break the trance. It's a fascinating thing about living from the limbic system. It's all about safety and knowing. And it puts us into a trance where we think, this is as good as it can get, or we don't think. Remember, the limbic system is all about patterned way of being. It is the frontal cortex that can ask the questions, that can feel, that can be open and receptive. I was curious. Well, I, so, I'm jumping a little ahead. Let me back up just a second. So, as we take on this theme of breaking wide open, don't get confused that we're thinking about, pot, you know, what do, what do we call it? Flipping our lid. <laughs> That's not helpful, right? Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to flip your lid because life has a way. This is the beauty of life. Life offers us hundreds of thousands of opportunities to break wide open. And sometimes we're going to flip our lid because we're going to be flooded with all that energy and emotion that can come from the limbic system. But there is something that we can do to transform that, that whole transition that we saw my coworker go through to make it a more in-the-moment experience. And study of neuroscience says it's through spiritual practice. That when we're willing to have a daily or regular practice of prayer, of meditation, of the RAIN process, of inquiry, they, they all fit right in there. We are breaking the pattern of just going along with the incessant chatter of our mind of going along with the feelings of deficiency or the feelings of grandiosity or all these things that the ego can create and all have their origin in the limbic brain. And here's what happens from a brain science standpoint. What the research shows is those practices, as simple as they can seem, create new neuroconnectors, new neuropathways, so instead of those well-grooved pathways that have been formed from our repetitive way of living, that when something comes up and has that energy that wants to flip the lid, that instead we don't lose ourselves. And when I say selves, I mean that larger, that adult self, our true self, you know, I had an experience this last week. I was in a meeting where something happened that totally had the potential of flipping my lid. And yet, 
I could feel it. I went, wow, I am really reacting to this. And I could feel all the chatter start, and I could feel all the anger and the hatred come up. But I was able to be there with it, to be curious, to be open. Neuroscience is, you know, a relatively new thing. Well, but let me first say, uh, drawing from Elizabeth Lesser in her book, Broken Open, she was uh, quoting or writing about her first meta teacher, meditation teacher, Trungya Trungpa. And she said this, and see if you can't hear neuroscience in it. He taught meditation as a twofold process, first as a way to access stability and dignity in the midst of any situation, to access stability and dignity in any situation. Does that sound like the limbic brain? Uh-uh. No. That would be the frontal cortex, that meditation develops those neuroconnectors, those neural pathways. And he goes on to say, and second, as a way to wake up as if from a dream into vibrant and genuine aliveness, just as my coworker woke up. We have the opportunity to quicken that process through our spiritual practice. And Charles Fillmore, writing in the 1930s in his book, Jesus Christ Heals, it says, time should be given to prayer and meditation daily. We cannot grow without them. And no man who neglects them will successfully develop his spiritual powers, will successfully transcend the patterning of life and open to the potential of life. I like to keep my goals manageable. <laughs> I've learned and so I'd love to say, let's let this be the year also of spiritual practice. If we're going to break wide open, if we want to claim the gifts that life is giving us to break wide open, let's develop that neural pathway so that we can be really open and receive it. Well, maybe, maybe some of you will make it the year of spiritual practice. But you know what? Starting next Sunday, we're starting a six-week series. Can we recommit to our spiritual practice for those six weeks? Can we meditate for five minutes a day? Or are we willing to sit down and, and move into a spiritual practice of prayer that transcends the messages of the limbic system, that constant chatter, and speaks to the potential? Are we willing? to engage in the RAIN process or inquiry, and I feel like I've kind of let you guys down. We will be starting a group of practice of the RAIN process after this six-week group. But are you willing to call somebody and say, hey, can we do some inquiry together? Can we practice the RAIN process? Life never gives up on you. Life gives you chance after chance to break wide open. Let's not miss those chances. Let's practice. Practice spiritually so that our minds, our brains are ready to take advantage, to see the potential, to break through the dream and the trance so that we can be open to new life to the freedom to claim the potential that is our very nature. I want us to now move into a time of meditation. I can see that we're, when you put two ministers on the stage together, you're in trouble. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> if you're at home and like, when's this going to end? Give us a couple more minutes, will you? I want you to take a nice deep breath with me. And we're just going to move into some time of practice. What makes meditation so powerful? Am, am I doing this right, Janice? Yes. Okay. I know we've, we've talked about so many different orders of service that I'm like, where, which one are we doing today? 
What makes meditation so powerful is that we're learning to concentrate beyond the chatter of the mind. And so as you allow yourself to begin to settle, I want you to put your attention on the uh, movement of your breath in your diaphragm. Watch the in and the out. Just stay with the in and the out. Or if you are more advanced and used to the cough meditation, put your attention on that cough center, which is near your belly button. Don't beat yourself up when you find yourself thinking. Just come back to either the breath or the cough. Confront the limbic brain through your ability to concentrate. Now gently bring your attention back, back to your breath, or back to your cost center. No judgment, just gently bring it back. And again, bring your attention back, back to your breath, back to the cough center. Mm -hmm. 